the members of District 2 Veterans of Foreign Wars of the United States are here assembled to pay a lasting tribute of respect to our departed comrade. When the call of our country was heard, Comrade Patrick Shipper answered. Self was forgotten in the cause of a greater good. Bravely he marched away with abiding faith in his God, his country, and his flag. The red of our country's flag was made redder by its heroism. The white more stainlessly pure by the motives which impelled him. And in the starry field of our nation's glorious banner, the blue has been glorified by the service he has given for American ideals. The chapel will invoke divine blessing, uncovered for a rest. Oh God. Father of us all, we here extend these final earthly tributes to our beloved comrade. Accept our prayers in behalf of the soul of thy servant, departed. Welcome them to thy house to rest in peace. Look with mercy upon the loved ones bereaved by their passing. Comfort and console them through thine own tenderness. These things we ask humbly in thy name. Amen. Cover. Attention. One by one, as the years roll on, we are called upon to devote these sad duties of our respect to our, to, of respect to our departed comrades. Officers of District 2, Veterans of Foreign Wars of the United States, you will now perform the duties, last duties of your station. Junior Vice Commander, Post. On behalf of District 2 Veterans of Foreign Wars of the United States, I present this ever being tribute as a symbol of our undying love for our country. Senior Vice Commander, Post. place these white flowers as a symbol of purity upon this casket, and may each future generation emulate the unselfish devotion to duty, even to the last of our comrades. Uh, 
Officer of the Day, close. To place this wreath as a last token of affection from their comrades in arms upon the casket of her departed comrade and crown their mortal dust with this symbol of victory. On behalf of our glorious republic, for whose integrity our comrades, for the veterans of foreign wars enlisted and served, we place upon its, their, its casket this emblem of our country, a country whose arms are always open to shelter the oppressed. We come today to honor the memory of one who offered his life as a service to our nation's cause and to our God. Proudly we remember his service. Because of men and women like our comrade, we live in a land of freedom, peace, and justice. May our ceremonies of today deepen our reverence for our honored comrade and friend. While we believe that Patrick is now in the hands of our Heavenly Father, the Supreme Commander and Judge of all, we lay our comrade's body to rest. Let us cherish his virtues and learn to imitate them. Let each of us be loyal and faithful to our remaining missions in life that we too may, will be able to join in that grand fraternity which is on earth and in heaven and remains unbroken. We realize how futile mere words are to express our deep and abiding sympathy in our loss. May we be comforted by the assurance that our comrade, friend, and loved one is at rest in God's eternal peace and abides in a place where all burdens are lifted and there is no more sickness and pain. Comrades, let us now pledge ourselves anew provide support and protection for those who are behind. Pick up the banner laid down by our comrade and to continue his march to face the challenges that confront us in this life. And may our God always be our companion and guide. We ask that any veterans in the uh, congregation wish to join us in a final salute to line up here we will go one by one as a final salute. Detail, right? Please. Kip, go.
This concludes our report. I have a feeling Patrick would wonder what all the attention is. Because he really did not like attention. And really did not like all of us. But we're really here to celebrate and to honor him and his life and his contributions and how he made this world a richer and better place. <clears throat> a limb has fallen from the family tree. I keep hearing a voice that says, grieve not for me. I want you all to remember the best times. I want you to remember the laughter, the music, and the times that we shared it did things together. My life may have been short, but overall I have lived a good life. And I have been strong. I want you to continue to carry on my heritage. I'm counting on you. Keep smiling and surely the sun will shine through. My mind now is at ease, and my soul is at rest, remembering all how truly I have been blessed, especially with Katie and Amanda and Zach. I had a little question about Zach, because when he was a baby, he was a handful. <laughs> but he proved me wrong and became such a fine young man. And I wish I could be here longer to watch my grandchildren grow up, but I know they are in very capable hands with their parents. And I know Leslie will help out to watch over and guide them. So go on with your lives. <coughs> And don't worry about things that are not that important. Because we only have this day, this moment, this time. <clears throat> Until we meet again, keep your chin up high. I will miss you all so dearly. Until that day comes when we are together again. Let us listen to our opening song. Amazing Grace.
merciful Father, giver of life, be with us this day as we celebrate Patrick's life. You have received him into your loving grace and care. Be with us who mourn his death. Be present and give us strength today. Watch over us and guide us and give us comfort and embrace. Watch over us, not only today, but tomorrow, the next, the weeks and months ahead. For we know you are our God, and you will guide us and support us. Amen. Today we gather to celebrate and to remember and to give thanks for Patrick's life while he was here on this earth. And he has left you three gifts. The first gift is his spirit. And you all know what I'm talking about, his spirit. That tenacity, that zeal for life. His commitment to serve our country and that dedication. That spirit to be with his family and children, that spirit of his smile and that spirit of generosity, that spirit that will live within your own hearts. The next gift he has given you is love, sometimes conditional. Right? Yes, Katie. But most of the time, unconditional. But that love that he gave, that he shared, that you can see in some of the photos, that love, that zeal, that compassion, and know that he will always be there with that love to guide you and strengthen you. And the third gift he has left are memories, sacred and treasured memories that no one can ever take away. And once again, they are examples in the photos as you look at some of those photos from when he was a young child to growing up. Those are the memories that you will hold and cherish that will connect us between us and him. So I would encourage you to continue to look at photos and to reminisce and to share stories of those memories. For those we will hold until our last breath. We are also here to support his family as they begin a journey that no longer contains Patrick. For his children, Amanda, Pete, Zachary, Tasha, Caitlin, Cole, their mother, Leslie, grandchildren, Ariana, Cora, Victoria, Lucy, and Zachary Jr. And cannot forget the siblings, Bruce, Pam, Spencer, Rebecca, Mary, John, and Chuck. The many nieces, cousins, friends, and all those he served with, serving our country. So on behalf of the family, thank you all for being here to support them and to celebrate Pat's life. Your presence here is very important. One, to stop and to acknowledge Pat's life and his contributions, and like I said, to support his family. So we take time out of the business of our day to recognize his contributions and how he made that difference. So we mark this time, this space as hallowed and special as we bring our broken hearts, memories, stories as we begin this celebration. You now are the keepers of his legacy to continue to carry on his exuberant strength that determination and experience that life has to offer. We will hear some stories of his life and have a snapshot of his 63 years. Washington Irving once said, there's a sacredness in tears. They are not of weakness, but of power. They speak more eloquently than 10,000 tongues. They are a messenger of an overwhelming grief and an unspeakable love. Always keep that in mind. Tears are not a sign of weakness, but of power, because they speak of our depth of our love for someone we care about. 
As I read the bio, if I get anything incorrect, do not blame me. Only blame Zach, Amanda, Katie, Pam, or John, or Leslie, who gave me the information. I am only the messenger, unless I type something wrong. Patrick was born on January 18, 1959. Patrick is playing with us. At least I have a big mouth. Zach, behave. But you can all hear me, correct? Good. Because Pat was quiet. I'm far from quiet. But Pat was one of eight kids. Born in Duluth, but when he was just a few months old, the family moved to Sioux Falls because dad was a very prominent baker. And so they moved to Sioux Falls where dad would be working. Patrick, like I said, was a quiet kid with a great sense of humor who liked to tease and maybe joke around, who also was a little mis. Mischievous. And Patrick, I was told, never really got into trouble. And also someone who really never got sick, but the siblings never ever told me who was the troublemaker of the siblings. John. And you are? Oh, so you're the troublemaker. You taught him everything he knew. Well, he must have got away with a lot and never got caught. You taught him, but you got caught. Well, I'm glad you got caught, and therefore he got away unscathed. So that's good. And John, you did get into trouble too? No. No, that's called denial. But that's okay. We know Patrick was competitive. He enjoyed playing softball and baseball with the neighborhood kids. As a matter of fact, later he played softball in high school. There was a term called the little boys, known as John, Pat, and Chuck. And oftentimes you would find them together. Maybe the three musketeers, I don't know, but I'm sure they found their own way of getting into trouble. They could be found in ditches, collecting bottles. How exciting. <laughs> but it was their way to make money so they could buy things, whatever it was, I'm not sure. They also enjoyed going to Skunk Creek. Now, I don't know what Skunk Creek had to offer. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Michael's one of our phenomenal directors here. <laughs> What was in Skunk Creek? Fishing. Who was a good fishing person? John, why do you keep saying you? <laughs> I, I learned from the Bible. You, you learned. But, and what was Patrick like in fishing? Oh, he was really good. He, well, then give him some credit. <laughs> Quit taking all the credit. <laughs> Just because he's not here to speak up. I'd like to know what he would have to say about you later. But you could spend hours fishing at the creek. Now, we also know that Pat could be a little bit of a jokester. Like at Halloween, he would rig some type of an apparatus over a tree. So when kids would come trick-or-treating, all of a sudden something would drop from the tree, like a ghost or something like that, and scare the crap out of kids. What a way to amuse yourself and what a way to maybe scare the crap and maybe hope that the kids would drop their candy and then he could scoop up and grab the candy. I don't know. And like I said, he could be a little bit of a judge. Where's Mary? Mary. Oh, poor Mary. Mary, do you remember the time when you were dating someone and your boyfriend happened to call and just as the phone rang, Pat picked up the phone almost at the same time and Pat began to talk to your boyfriend. And I hope, this was a long time ago, so hopefully your husband doesn't care what we're talking about here. But 
Pat begins to talk to your boyfriend about the black book that you had with all the names of all your boyfriends who you have been dating at the time. <laughs> Only to say that this guy that you had the hots or interest in never called back again. <laughs> Only to turn out, though, too, by the way, Mary never had a black book. <laughs> but it was one way to be a Joseph. Did you talk to your brother for a while after? Oh, yeah. So you forgave him? Oh, yeah. After I smacked him. <laughs> oh, so you smacked your brother? I did. Mary. <laughs> By the way, did you even have maybe just a few names in a book? No. <laughs> That's okay. We can talk about it later. <laughs> later, he liked to play the trumpet. Matter of fact, I understand most of the siblings play a musical instrument. He played trumpet for a while, but for some reason he decided to end up playing tuba. Can you imagine in the marching band that he was in, carrying that thing, playing tuba, marching in a band? I could just see Patrick with that thing. One of Patrick's first jobs was working at JB Big Boy Restaurant. Never heard of it. But he enjoyed working there because it was a way for him to make some money and to start saving some money because he wanted to provide board games for his family. And you remember some of the board games that you would play? Matter of fact, you would play board games that would last for hours and hours and hours. And it was one of the first games, was it some type of a metal football game or something, that he bought. And he got a kick out of that. When he was about 16 years old, his brother John decided to abuse him and knock the teeth out of his mouth. John will explain more of that in a little bit. Pat, we also know, was very crafty and built a comic book bookcase, which I'll talk more about some of his other things he did. But he built this bookcase with small slots that he could put his comic books in. He also loved to do model airplanes and model cars. Patrick, because maybe he was shy, and Patrick was somewhat good looking, but he never dated. I don't know why, he never ever dated. So once again, and it's not like I'm picking on John, but John, being a nice brother, decides to help Patrick find a date. So I don't know if you know this, but your uncle finds a girl in band and hooks John up, or hooks Patrick up for a date to prom. Thank you for offering to do that for your brother. So this other band member and Pat go off on prom, the next day, John calls Pat and says, how was your date? He didn't say much about the date. All he said is that it was fun to drive her car. <laughs> Who knows? We know that Patrick graduated from Washington High School in Sioux Falls in 1977. And after high school, he enlisted in the Air National Guard. And by the way, just an FYI, all the family served our country, and according to John, all together spent 167 years serving our country. Yeah. What an accomplishment. 167 years serving our country. I salute you and I thank you for your contribution and your dedication, what you did for our country. After basic training in 78, Patrick started working for, is it Wool? How do you pronounce it? Wool. Wool. Shoe Company as an assistant manager in Des Moines. Several months later, in November of 78, he was transferred to Yonkers Department Store in Austin, where Wool had a shoe department that they had leased. Can you just see Patrick as a shoe salesman, manager? <laughs> Well, it kind of had a benefit being a shoe salesman. Because in 1980, while working one day, this charming young lady comes walking in who was looking for a pair of shoes for her brother's wedding. And as she's trying on these shoes, Patrick says to this lady, would you like to go to a cheap trick concert? <laughs> 
I thought it's pretty funny, two girls. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Why, why would you ask somebody to a cheap trick? How do you even know they would like cheap trick? Right? I love the babes. I just love it. And of course, I'm not sure if this lady knew what cheap trick was. Matter of fact, I can even take it a different way. I don't know. But by the way, this lady's name was Leslie. And I asked her, I said, why were you attracted to the shoe guy? And she said, well, you know what? He was fun. He liked to dance. And, you know, he was good looking. And I thought, okay. And also he was a gentleman. He was thoughtful, he was kind. And so they began to date. I think another reason why Leslie wanted to date him and eventually marry him is because there was a huge perk. What woman does not like shoes? <laughs> I like to know how many pairs of shoes she got, especially samples. A few. I bet you quite a few. Leslie decided to quit school and marry Patrick on September 12th of 81 in Blooming Prairie, Minnesota. And like I said, she had a huge shoe collection. May of 81, they were living in Cheyenne, Wyoming, where Patrick was transferred. By the way, I just have to do a side note here. As I read this, it sounds like Pat was a fugitive running away from the law or in a witch or in a witness protection program. I've never seen a man transfer and go to so many places in all my life. So now we're in Cheyenne, where he really enjoyed spending time, and you two decided you wanted to have a little fun, let's just say, before you decide to have children, correct? Because it was about four years you wanted to just kind of, as you would say, sow your oats. So you were involved in sports. Patrick was always very supportive, would attend your games. You also played some co-ed together. You went skiing in Colorado. You did some other things together. And you enjoyed your time. Eventually, you also went back to school to finish your degree. The hope and idea also was that Patrick would go back to school and get a degree because Pat was very, very smart. He was very intelligent. Patrick could do anything and everything if he really set his mind to it. But for some reason, Pat decided not to really pursue an educational degree, for whatever reason. June of 85, they had their first child, a very beautiful, bright baby daughter, Angelic, named Amanda, who was born in Casper. What a gift you were, Amanda. Then came Zach in 86. And like I said, Zach was a little bit of a handful. Nothing like Amanda. But that's okay, Zach. You turned out great as you are today. Matter of fact, Zach, where you were only maybe, what, 10 days old, ended up going to Ogden, Utah. Here we go again. We're off to Utah now. Where Pat continued to work in sales. After all these years working for the shoe company and probably being there and working up the ladder and doing quite well, the company decided that it was time to let Pat go. Maybe because he was making too much money. Maybe because there were younger kids they could hire at a lot less rate, which I'm sure was somewhat devastating for him. Eleanor Roosevelt once said, what one has to do usually can be done. And that was Pat. Whatever had to be done, whatever needed to be done, Pat would find a way to do it. So in 1987, again, the family moved now to Mankato, where Pat started to work for a company called the National Plan. The company was a company that would sell booklets on how to make and build like decks 
and other types of things for companies such as Lowe's or Menards. And so that's where he worked. I, had to, I thought maybe it was an insurance company, but it was not. It was, they sold booklets that go on a spinner that you would be able to get on how to build various things for products that they sold. He then joined the Air National Guard, March of 92. Then another beautiful, beautiful, precious angel came along. What are you laughing about? Mary? Mary, go work on your black book. <laughs> then Katie came along. Now, two girls and a boy. Dad could not be more happier and proud. Now his family was complete. Dad, unfortunately, worked a lot. So dad was not always home, but mom did the best she could in helping raise the children. The family did take various vacations. They would come back to Minnesota to see family. In 2002, the kids went to Bible camp. Do you remember the minivan ride? That must have been kind of fun, that little minivan ride. Then they decided to go to Las Vegas, visit for a wedding. And then they decided to drive to California for a day. You also took various road trips to places like the Wisconsin Dells and other places just to travel and to do things. I understand that mom was more stricter than dad and dad was much more laid back. Dad also coached Amanda and Zach in T-ball. Was dad a good coach from what you can remember? I'm sure, when you were little. In November of 91, Patrick became the night manager for Hy-Vee Foods in Owatonna. Patrick, as you may know, was somewhat more of a homebody, who really did not like to go out, but liked to stay more at home. He was also the one who was always behind the camera. So whenever there was family gatherings or things going on, he'd be the one taking the pictures. Leslie, though, was the one who always made sure that the kids were dressed. And even when they were younger, she always made sure that you kids were in matching outfits. Oh, how nice. I'll have to see some of those pictures later. Dad was an okay cook, but his greatest strength was Baker. And maybe because he got that from his father. Patrick could make Dutch apple pancakes, elaborate pies, desserts that he loved to show off. Most recently, he started to learn how to make baklava. He would make Christmas cookies and other types of cookies. He also learned to experiment with various recipes. And I'm sure some of you were the guinea pigs who had to try to sample those cookies. Dad taught the kids about things. He would keep them up sometimes late at night, gazing at the stars. You guys would oftentimes debate various things, especially politics, and I'm not sure who would win, because I'm not sure if all of you were on the same side of the aisle as Dad was. I think you were on different sides, some of you. So I'm assuming some of those debates were pretty fun. He collected a number of coins, challenge coins, and displayed his flags and military memorabilia proudly in his home, as you will see over here on this table. Being in the service allowed him to see a lot of the world. He continued to serve by volunteering his time with the VFW, including holding a post as the second district commander. It was in May of 1999, he went to work for Target, now in New Orleans, as logistics manager until Target closed. It was in 2008, though, that Patrick and Leslie decided to go their separate ways. But they continued to have one focus, and that was on their children. He liked to play jokes. And one time while at Target, he decided to take packing foam and fill one of the co-workers' cars full of foam. <laughs> I'm sure that person was not too thrilled. Also, back in the day, his kids were picky eaters. So one time, he had made something for the kids to eat, and the kids thought they were eating chicken, only to find out later that they were actually eating fish. 
2016, he became a production supervisor for a short time in Mankato. And then later in Mankato, he worked for U Square from 17 to 2020. In 2020, he moved to the greatest part of St. Paul. And of course, that is the east side of St. Paul. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the east side. <laughs> I grew up on the east side. Is there a problem? <laughs> but he grew up, uh, he went to the east side because he wanted really to be closer to his children. Pat was born to be a grandfather. When his first grandchild was about to be born, he was not particularly patient. You were having a little bit of a complication, waiting and waiting. And Pat did not like to wait. Matter of fact, he loved to spoil these kids. He would buy special gifts, especially educational gifts. Not just any random gift, but it had to be something that would help them learn and help them grow their brains. He would get down on the floor and read books and play games with them. He even bought them their first orange soda, which I'm sure was not too thrilling to the parents because he would like sometimes to get them sugared up, riled up, and then send them back with the three. But I'm sure the three of them put some gray hair in mom and dad's head and riled them up. This way it was Pat's way to get back to these kids. And he always called them kiddos which he even called the adults kiddos. He continued to teach them about the world, just like he did with his own kids. Patrick also gave the kids a very special gift from Bill the Bear. He had done a special recording for each grandchild that had a very special message to each one. Pat really was not a picky eater, but one thing was very clear, he did not like Amanda's stuffed peppers with turkey, and he did not like the kids cooking. Not sure what that has to say about the three of you with your culinary skills. <laughs> Pat liked his guns and truly did believe in the First Amendment rights. Pat really was a sharp dresser. He was a good looking tall guy who took very good care of himself. And he was also very proud of his Irish heritage. Matter of fact, not long ago, he went out and bought two kilts and the socks and everything. And I had asked and challenged Zach today that if he would wear one of the kilts, I would wear one of the kilts. And as you can see, neither one of us are wearing the kilts. You chickened out. He was very hands-on. He loved to do things and have various projects, fix things and tinker. And if he didn't know how to do certain things, he would Google just to make sure they could get done right. And he also had all kinds of tools. You name it, he would have it. And he was also very, very well organized. He always was creating something, such as his custom chest set out of cologne bottles, the pallet Christmas tree for each kid, and refurbishing the grandfather clock. Or like I said, the bookcase he made for the comic books. Or when he was young, the four by eight plywood map was of the Oregon Trail, that then he put Christmas lights behind it so that it could be lit up. Patrick also had a sweet tooth where he enjoyed his chocolate or ice cream, Oreo cookies, M&M's, ice cream, cake, cherry pie, chocolate chip cookies. And I understand what at Thanksgiving he could have up to what, five desserts? <laughs> and he stayed thin? Lord help me. He also liked his black coffee, Diet Coke, and Katie introduced him to chai tea. Did he like the chai tea? You think so? He might have just humored you. But I think he liked chai tea. He enjoyed watching the Vikings, and after the game, he would text Zach about the game. I wonder how many times he would cuss at the TV when the Vikings were not doing so well. The family started doing family conference calls weekly after the Game of Thrones. I don't know what people saw in the Game of Thrones. I have never watched it. Much of the chagrin of the spouses, because I don't know, did the spouses watch the Game of Thrones? You did kind of watch it, some of you? Who knows? He also liked watching MASH and the old 60s shows, listening to various types of movies. 
Pat would drop anything and everything for those he loved if somebody needed something. He was there for everyone to do what he needed, even despite his failing needs. Needs. He would do monthly Zoom calls with his siblings, and he never would miss a family reunion. Matter of fact, last year, and Pam will talk about this, about their trip to Alabama when they went for their aunt's 100th birthday. Patrick was quiet, stubborn, set in his ways, conservative, and would speak without filter. Be who you are and say what you feel, because those who mind don't matter, and those who matter don't mind. Dr. Seuss. Patrick was also dedicated, reliable, thoughtful, conscientious, loving, helpful, and supportive. Patrick was intelligent, someone who loved reading, great at playing trivial pursuit, or trivia pursuit, witty, generous, loving, and love, showing his love by actions, and never on time. So maybe tomorrow, unfortunately we cannot go, we could be late for his burial. Pat had a wonderful phrase if things were not always going right. Piss on that! He would always say, like the time when Zach and Dad were carrying a couch up the steps to his place and they couldn't get on it and couldn't make the turns and Dad just kind of looked at Zach and just said, piss on that! <laughs> Don't you kids say that. <laughs> but that was his famous little phrase. In one of the stars, I shall be living. In one of them, I shall be laughing. And so it will be if all the stars were laughing. And when you look at the night sky, you, only you, will have the stars that can laugh. Thomas Jefferson once said, and this is so true about Patrick, the happiest moments of my life have been the few which I have passed at home in the bosom of my family. Patrick was never happier than being with his family. His three children, his grandchildren, his siblings, and those people he loved. He served our country faithfully and dedicated, and yes, sometimes had to make sacrifices. But he truly loved and has left a void in so many lives yet he will be remembered for the gifts that he gave to all of us. At this time, I'm going to invite Pam to share a few thoughts. After that, John will come forward, and then the kids will be coming forward after that to share some thoughts about the father. We 
enjoyed our cousin's southern hospitality. On the day of the birthday, Cap could be found in the kitchen helping with the pulled pork and setting up tables and helping to serve. He really loved to volunteer and to serve others. It was a memorable trip that we will always cherish. Say first, uh, it's really fun to, to recap a life of a wonderful man like that and uh, to listen to some of these memories. I hope I can add to some of that, and share with you. It's uh, it was wonderful for me to, to follow in his footsteps and to, to learn from him as well as my other siblings. But I wrote down a few paragraphs here I'd like to share with you. Just a few memories that I have of our brother Pat. <clears throat> it's interesting to grow up in a large family. Never a dull moment. There's always something that we can learn from one another. Some of the high stress moments are never forgotten, and some of the kind hearted moments will always stay with us. It's the day to day experiences that sometimes can be hard to recall. Like if you're one of the youngest, remembering all the good that the older siblings brought to the group. The same can be said if you're the, one of the oldest, remembering all the silliness or goofiness or wonderful attributes of the <laughs> Well, today I'd like to remember some of those attributes of our, of our dear brother, Patrick. Pat is the name I always used. And I don't believe that Pat had a silly nickname like some of us, like, uh, I guess he doesn't look like a scooter. <laughs> Maybe a goober, a goober like we used a lot, but definitely a Pat. Um, some of these memories that were shared earlier, I'll try to recap. One memory was when Pat was old enough to find a job. And this is past the gathering bottles and the ditches. Mm -hmm. Getting 10 cents a bottle is quite good. Right? <laughs> uh, mowing and shoveling snow are hard to get because there's a lot of kids in that neighborhood. But Pat did land a job. He, he uh, would ride at his 10 speed all the way into Sioux Falls to work at J.D. Big Boy and later on to that new Western Mall that was being built, you know, the Yonkers store. Uh, shoes. I was, it was quite intimidating. And as you know, he was a shoe seller, and, and he loved it. Um, but that job earned him some spending money, and uh, he would buy a suit. And in that, those years, it was like a leisure suit, if you remember the white collars. I remember borrowing one of those suits to go on a, on a dance one time. It was really kind of nice of him to do that. The thing is, though, he would spend his money on other things, too. And it was mentioned earlier, like comic books or active games. Pat was really a big believer in getting us together to either throw the football. It was football that he played in, in high school. And that board game was a football game, the Vikings and the Packers. And he played it well enough to rig it so that the Packers would never win. <laughs> but it was an electronic game. You turn it on and vibrate, and the little pieces would move, and it felt, felt like, you know, you made the score. It was fun. Other long games were like Risk or Chess or Backgammon. I think Lee Chuck is really a backgammon player because of that. Just to name a few, but one that I remember, and, and it was the best game or the most traumatic, it was this game called Jokari. I don't know what it is, but it's like um, rapid ball, but outside. It had a cement slab that a big rubber band was tied to it. And at the other end was handball, racquetball. You used paddles. And we played for weeks, and we were getting really good at it. Then we decided to play doubles, we were all so competitive. During, during this play, because Pat and I were on the same team, he, would, he played the forward, and I was in the back end. And with all the action going to the front, Pat made most of the plays. And that was fine. It was his game. Right. But well into the game, the ball was finally hit hard enough to get passed back and back into my area. I was ready. I was going to hit that ball so hard, it would have won the game. Right? Except I didn't want to hit the ball. 
uh, my follow through caught Pat kind of right in the face. I know this uh, sounds terrible, but I don't mean to laugh, but I'm more of laughing because I survived the incident. Uh, because, and I'll say this in my own words, I can remember his teeth falling, but I didn't know his teeth. It sounded like glass. I can still hear it. And I knew I should stand next to Pat because I just broke all his teeth out, right? <laughs> so I was heading down the road. I was already starting to make the move. I know he couldn't catch me, but especially if I had a jump. But he was calling me, and he, he said, come on back. I started to doubt that because I knew he just was going to trick me to get me close to him. And then he started to laugh, and I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> but he said, no, it's okay. It was none of that. My brother Pat saw an opportunity. He wasn't mad at me or for the fact that he was missing all of his front teeth. Growing up, you see, Pat, uh, yes, he was a bit on the shy side, but I think it was all related to his mouth, probably, in my opinion. He inherited the shipper mouth, narrow chin, lots of teeth, no chance for braces, I guess. But And we have what we call the shipper smile, especially when we're, we're focused on something. We, we can really show our teeth. <laughs> But with a laugh, with that laugh, he was already starting to formulate a plan. He said, come on, John, let's go. Help me pick these up. Let's go show Mom. <laughs> and with his open hand for Mom to see, hey, Mom, can you guess what these are? <laughs> and upon her first gaze, because they didn't look like they, they were shards, right? No, why no, what are they? And they said, look, cheese. There's no teeth there. Our Mom gasped and then screamed and then shouted, what did you do now? <laughs> Funny, I don't remember anything after that other than the fact that it was a happy moment for Pat. He went to the dentist, he got a new smile. Things changed for Pat. I think if I look back now, it's kind of benefit with age. We can look back and see how much he grew. He was already a wonderful example. He loved people. Um, it was hard to sometimes express that, but it certainly bloomed later. So it's interesting to realize to look back that what could have been just one game, but it's that one game that I think changed Pat's life forever. I'm grateful to have been a part of it. I think it's wonderful for his example. And uh, I don't know why I'm so nervous, but I just feel like a leader. I could have used his public speaking skills. I love you, Pat, forever. I love all of you, and I'm grateful to be part of it.
He was so excited for his first grandchild to be born. And he did not have the best timing. <laughs> but he was reliable, and he would always be there for us, and we will always remember how much he loved us. For anyone that doesn't know me, my name is Zach. I'm, I'm Pat's son. Uh, my beautiful wife isn't here right now, but I have three of the kids that have been running around bothering everybody. Um, on behalf of our family and friends, I'd like to thank everyone for their support, their condolences, and their prayers throughout this time. Uh, when, when we started, or when this all started, uh, when the incident started, he, uh, we had started a caring bridge for Dad, um, and I've always considered him to be um, not, I wouldn't call him a loner, but he was very, he was a private person. He was, he had a close group of family and friends. Um, and I was just blown away to find that the site had been visited 2,000 times. And I'm impressed to see so many people here. Um, <clears throat> growing up, our dad was always there for us. Uh, whether that be through emotional support, help with our homework, uh, going to our sporting events, uh, man, when you start to cry, you can't really read that well. <laughs> uh, uh, when, when I was in middle school, I had a basketball game that day, and I realized midday I forgot my jersey. So I, I knew I could call my dad, and I could, I could count on him to bring it to me. Bring it to me. Um, so, and he brought the jersey. I quick grabbed it, ran to go get dressed. Um, as I started to put it on, I realized. It smells like a bionic air freshener. <laughs> I realized he'd soak it in Febreze, which, if anybody doesn't know, that's what you use to make carpets and, and couches smell better. But, <laughs> uh, as I ran up and down the court, I just became nauseous. <laughs> Who knows what my coach, what my teammates, uh, what other players were thinking of me. Um, but his excuse that day was, it smelled so bad already, it had to help. <laughs> I, I don't remember if we won that game, or I'll always remember his smile when I tell that story. I can't do that once again. <laughs> um, our dad, um, as many of you know, was a jokester and a prankster, but he always would play those jokes on people that he loved. He do that once there. <laughs> uh, this is the rest of Zach's speech. My dad would never be the one to say I love you or initiate a hug, but I think we all know how he felt. We love you, Dad, more than you'll ever know, and I'll continue to tell you that every day. Thank you for.
I got a phone call from Amanda telling me Dad had another brain bleed and I should come up and see him as soon as I can. We were taking turns and the 29th happened to be my day off. I panic hacked as much as I could, as much as I could think of, and we were on our way within 30 minutes. As we were passing Fort Snelling, we heard a loud noise. But we couldn't quite pinpoint it until we saw that tire light come on. We pulled up to the side of the road and Cole started to change the tire. There were multiple vehicles driving by and one was even parked right next to us. And then there was a guy in a big red truck just like Dad's. And he stopped and helped us. We didn't really need it, but he did have a tool that helped us go a little faster. Um, and he was a very nice man. And even though he was on his way to the airport, he was a pilot. Um, he stopped just like our dad would have stopped and helped someone else. This was the last day of my dad's life. I made it up to see him within 30 minutes. And then within 30 minutes, he passed. I know this was in some way dad stopping to help me change one more tire. <laughs> We will always have our dad as our guardian angel. Pat always did things his way. So let us now hear
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of the righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, I comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will truly dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going? Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This week, for many Christians, we celebrate the most holiest of all Christians, and that is the beginning of Holy Week, when Christ is crucified and raised from the dead. Scripture says, all who believe in me shall have eternal life. For I have gone to prepare a place. And when Christ was crucified on that Good Friday, he even screamed out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Just as I'm sure some of you are sitting here wondering why did this have to happen to Patrick? Why at a young age, at 63, did this have to happen? And yet, we will never understand the whys. Accidents, unfortunately, happen. Things do happen. What I do know, for a fact, is that God did not take Patrick. God received Patrick. Just like on that Good Friday, God receives Christ. God did not take Christ. God received him. Because if we believe that God takes, then what kind of a God do we have? God received him into his loving care. Because none of us knows the time, nor the date, nor the hour when death shall come. What we do know is we have this moment, this place, this time. So my challenge for you is brief. Appreciate life. And never take life for granted. Because none of us has the next 10 minutes, to be honest. Let alone tomorrow. Patrick lived life to the fullest. He really did. He served our country. He traveled the world. He saw so many things. He raised a family. Saw his grandchildren. Yes, maybe he wished he could have saw them grow up. Maybe even have a few more grandkids. Like maybe 20, 30 more. Zach says no. Are you done? Maybe a couple more. Dad's going to be around to help you. But he really did live life. He lived life to the fullest. There was only one little thing, though, about Patrick, though, and it was kind of mentioned. 
Patrick showed love by deeds, by action. But it was hard for him to say, I love you. And I think that has to do with his siblings and with your parents, who did not always say or show affection and to say, I love you, or to give hugs, or to say, I'm so proud of you. I hope that stops today. I hope that out of Pat's death, that you will learn to hug, that you will learn to say, I love you, that you will learn to say, I appreciate you, you're important to me. Now, yes, you may say to somebody, I love you, they may look at you and ask you, what did you do wrong? How much do you need? And you say, I did nothing wrong. I need nothing. I just want you to know that I love you and I appreciate you. We do not give enough compliments and we do not find ways to build people up. Pat would want you to do that. If you haven't done some Adam or random acts of kindness, do that. Help someone in need. Volunteer. If you haven't told a vet lately that you appreciate their service to our country, let them know that you appreciate their sacrifices and what they've done. In other words, Pat's legacy can continue to live on in each of you. Learn to love, learn to appreciate, Learn to give, learn to compliment, and never ever take life for granted. The Lord is our shepherd. He guides us. He gives us strength. He will protect us. He gives us opportunities. And on that day when Patrick was received by God, God looked at Patrick and said to Patrick, well done, my faithful servant. Well done. Welcome home. Welcome home. Thank you. Now you may find rest in one of those rooms that I have told you, that I have prepared for you. Welcome home, faithful servant. Let us listen to our next song.
footman once rode afoot and lighthearted, I take to the open road. Healthy, free, the world before me, the long brown path before me leading now wherever I choose. Henceforth I ask not good fortune, I am good fortune. Henceforth I whipper no more, postpone no more, need nothing. Strong and content, I now travel that open sky. Let us pray the prayer that our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And it is not in the tradition, but for the rest of the evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us now listen to On Evil's Wings. <coughs>
we prepare to conclude this service, let us take a final glimpse at Patrick's life. Please look at the screen.
If you're struggling or have something going on, think of Pat. Hold on to it. If you're going fishing, ask him to help you get a good fish. If you're trying to bake something, ask Pat to make sure your recipe goes well. And hold on, as you look at those pictures, you look around, Patrick really lived life the best he could. So I appreciate every day, and please take one of the stones with you. Only when you drink from the river of silence shall you indeed sing. And when you have reached the mountain top, then you shall begin to climb. And when the earth shall claim your limbs, then shall you truly dance. I want to conclude with something by John McGee of High Flight. Oh, I have slipped the surely bonds on earth and danced the skies on laughter silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of, wheeled and soared and swung, high in the sunlit silence, hovering there. I chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air, up, up the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the wind-swept heights with ease and grace, where never lark or never eagle flew, and while with silent, lifting mind, I poured the high, untrepassed sanctity of peace, but on my hand and touched the face of God. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind always ever be at your back. May the sun shine, warm shine upon your face, and the rains fall soft upon your fields until we meet again. May God hold you in the palm of his hand. May the blessings of God's soft rain be on you, falling gently on your head, refreshing your soul with the sweetness of little flowers newly blooming. May the strength of the winds of heaven bless you, carry the rain to wash your spirit clean, sparkling after in the sunlight. May the blessing of God's earth be on you. May we thank God for the food which we are about to receive, that it may give us strength. And as you walk the roads, may you always have a kind word to those whom you meet. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance and give you every grace. And as we prepare to celebrate the death and resurrection of our Lord, may we always be kind and find hope in that resurrection that we too one day will be reunited with our God, with our God and with our Savior forever and ever. Amen. God bless us all. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Tomorrow we will bring our brother Patrick to his final rest at Fort Snelling National Cemetery, where he will be buried with full military honors. Amen.
You can't expect to be perfect to fight, you gotta forfeit. You belong to me.